Presenting for Restful Death, I Cry. We turn our attention once again to Shakespeare's sonnets in the quarto of 1609. Sonnet 66 may be one of the most perplexing sonnets in the quarto. Here goes. Tired with all these, for restful death I cry, as to behold desert a beggar born and needy nothing trimmed in jollity, and purest faith unhappily forsworn, and gilded honor shamefully misplaced, and made in virtue rudely strumpeted, and right perfection wrongfully disgraced, and strength by limping sway disabled, and art made tongue-tied by authority, and folly doctor-like controlling skill, and simple truth miscalled simplicity, and captive good attending captain ill. Tired with all these, from these would I be gone, save that to die I leave my love alone. It's perplexing, not for its theme, but for its odd words. The poet seems to have become like a stuck record. And, 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 and. This is an example of the rhetorical, fig rhetorical figure of polysenditon, which is the use of multiple conjunctions close together. While there are quite a few words between these conjunctions, visually and is right above each other, I would say that it is this rhetorical figure. And we also find 12 examples of anaphora in which the same words appear at the beginning of successive lines. And there are two repeating phrases. Tired, tired with all these is actually the theme of the entire poem. These words cry out to be interpreted as clues to add things and above each other ten times. And this phrase looks like a hidden instructions to a puzzle. All these from these. The gematria sum of all uppercase letters outside of the brackets in this poem is 175. Subtract the value of the uppercase letter in brackets and subtract the number of words in brackets. This is what you get, 170. The gematria sum of these uppercase letters in lines 1 and 2 is 51, or 17 times 3. We use the and, the word and, as kind of a barrier between gematria sums. We're going to see this later on. Once again, The Latin alphabet repeated count value of the sonnet number is V, V, V. So here we have an example of the Trio Santomnia principle again, three clues to the writer's identity. Just for good measure, the gematria value of uppercase letters outside of brackets, but not along the left-hand margin, is 80. Line 9 shows us a reason for these numbers. Art has been made tongue-tied by authority. The author could not reveal his true name in print, which is why he calls himself Needy Nothing, in an example of Eleism, in which he refers to himself in the third person. Hidden in the lines are glimpses of his life. Line 2 describes how at one point he had only four servants. He may have suffered from depression, which is explained or at least disclosed in line 3. Needy nothing trimmed in jollity. His sovereign doubted his loyalty and faith to her, which is described in line 4. 
purest faith unhappily forsworn. He misplaced his honor and money among people who took advantage of his generosity, which is gilded honor shamefully misplaced. Lines six and seven are about how he wrongfully accused his first wife of infidelity, maiden virtue rudely strumpeted. Line seven and right perfection wrongfully disgraced has a dual meaning, which I'll explain later. He was made partially lame in a street fight. Strength disabled by limping sway is an alternate way of reading this line. Because of his status, he could not publish under his real name. Again, art was made tongue-tied by authority. From the late 1580s to around 1591, he owned Fisher's Folly and mentored writers and musicians. That is the meaning behind folly, doctor-like controlling skill. He was controlling the skill of the other writers by asking them to edit things, changing things around, just like a surgeon would in the operating theater. In fact, the clue folly is a dead giveaway about his writer's colony. Simple Truth Miscalled Simplicity is about how some people mistakenly called him simple. Here is what William Cecil said of him. I confess to your lordship I do honor him so dearly from my heart as I do my own son, and in any case that may touch him for his honor and weal, I shall think him mine own interest therein. And surely, my lord, by dealing with him, I find that which I often heard of your lordship. There is much more in him of understanding than any stranger to him would think. And for my part, I find that whereof I take comfort in his wit and knowledge grown by good observation. Here Cecil is talking about his ability to study very closely. Good observation being a way of saying he was a great student. Simple, the word simple has these meanings as well. Artless, I mean in other words, direct, absolute, or just, as it says in the Oxford English Dictionary. In a letter he famously wrote, I am that I am, directly quoting the Bible. He's telling us he is what you get. You see what you get. You see. The gematria sum for this line is 38. When we subtract the number of words, we get 34. Don't forget that the hyphen between simple truth creates a single word out of the two words. Alternately, we can subtract the gematria value of the uppercase D in brackets to get 34 once again. Captive good attending Captain Ill alludes to serving someone he knew was bad. He talks himself of himself as captive good in the third person in another example of Eliasm. One person comes to mind who this could have been, Sir Christopher Hatton, the poet's arch nemesis, who is captain of the Queen's bodyguard in 1581. He is Captain Ill. The last couplet describes his deep depression, and the last line is how about how he regrets leaving his love behind, save that today I, I leave my love alone. There is corroborative evidence in Nathaniel Baxter's Sir Philip Sidney's Urania, first published in 1606, which has this segment of a poem. The first was Vera, daughter to an earl, who whilom a paragon of mickle might, and worthily then termed Albion's pearl, for bounty in expense and force in fight. Me list to give so great a prince his right, 
In all the triumphs held in Albion soil, he never yet received disgrace or foil. Only some think he spent too much in vain. That was his fault, but give his honor due. Learned he was, just, affable, and plain. No traitor but ever gracious and true, Gainst princes' priests a plot he never drew. But as they be deceived, that too much trust, So trusted he some men that proved unjust. Weak are the wits that measure noblemen, But by accidental things that ebb and flow, His learning made him honorable then as trees their goodness by their fruits do show, so we do princes by their virtues know. For riches, if they make a king, tell then, what differ poorest kings from poorest men? Line two is explained by this line in Baxter's poem. Only some think he spent too much in vain. He became a beggar. Baxter restates the poet's poverty here. What differs poorest kings from poorest men? Line four in the sonnet is corroborated here in Baxter's poem where he says, no traitor but ever gracious and true gainst princes peace a plot he never drew. Line five, gilded honor shamefully misplaced is partially corroborated here. Baxter says, only some think he spent too much in vain. That was his fault, but give his honor due. And the line is fully corroborated here. So trusted he some men that proved unjust. That is why his gilded honor was shamefully misplaced. Baxter describes the father of Vera as honorable here. He never yet received disgrace or foil. Again, it's talking about his gilded honor. But Baxter restates that the poet was honorable here. His learning made him honorable then. But Baxter was unaware of the poet's disgrace at Queen Elizabeth's court. That is the secondary meaning of line seven of Sonnet 66 and right perfection wrongfully disgraced. The poet was disgraced at Queen Elizabeth's court by slanders and libels uttered by two of his enemies. Tragically, they were both his cousins. So the fact that Baxter said he never yet received disgrace or foil tells me that Baxter knew the poet personally, but did not know the poet's full story. He wasn't privy to the inner workings of the court. Given these parallels, these poems describe the same man. There is further corroboration of this line, line three, needy nothing trimmed in jollity, in a poem published under the poet's initials E.O. from 1576 in the Paradise of Dainty Devices. Here is the poem. I am not as I seem to be, nor when I smile, I am not glad. A thrall, although you count me free, I, most in mirth, most pensive sad. I smile to shade my bitter spite. Lines four and five. I, most in mirth, most pensive shad, shad, sad, rather. I smile to shade my bitter spite. Are perfect mirrors of line three in the sonnet. Needy nothing trimmed in jollity. He's talking about his nothingness, his sadness, trimmed in jollity. He's saying exactly, I smile to shade my bitter spite. Here the word shade means disguise. Let's get back to the numbers. The final couplet has a gematria sum of 55. Remember that I said at the beginning, the word and kind of divides up the poem into different segments, and that is a barrier between gematria sums. Well, the gematria sum of the final couplet is 55. We subtract the value of the letter D in brackets 
to get 51. Giving us the number 51 twice. There are 41 unbracketed words behind the ands. We subtract this word from the total to get 40. Remember, Dr. Like is hyphenated to become a single word. The number is half of 80. Let's do a gematria sum for all uppercase letters on the left hand margin. Left hand meaning far left hand. They add to 66, the number of the sonnet. Once again, we have V, V, V in the Latin alphabet repeating count, but this time it is a gematria sum and further evidence of the author's real identity. Given that we can easily match all of the lines to a specific man's life, and given also that the numbers we have discovered also allude to that same man's life, we can conclude with certainty that the sonnet is about him and deeply personal. This means the conventional idea that the poems are not autobiographical is wrong. As presented in this book published in 2020, All the Sonnets of Shakespeare, edited by Sir Stanley Wells and Dr. Paul Edmondson. We can easily see the biographical details in the poems in the poem when we know the details in his life and that the lines specifically refer to different events and conditions of his life. And the numerical allusions point to one man. His family motto was Vero Nihil Various, or V V. And his surname was Veer, contrary to all the sonnets of Shakespeare. This sonnet and the sonnets in the 1609 quarto were written by this man. Edward de Vere, the 17th Earl of Oxford. He was writing under the name William Shakespeare. Thanks for watching. Stay safe.